Hello, and welcome back to new 332, um, Buddhism and Psychotherapy, or Buddhisms and Psychotherapies, as I prefer. Uh, and uh, technically, I suppose this is the set of lectures for March 8th, but it's March 10th. Um, I do appreciate everybody's uh, patience in this respect. This week has been, if I may borrow the technical term, an ass kicker, um, which is to say that it's been very, very busy and very high emotional tension in a bunch of different directions. Uh, and I have not had a whole lot of surplus energy, unfortunately. So this has obviously caused me to lag in my production. Uh, and as I sort of uh, hinted, hinted, declared, um, <laughs> that um, uh, I too am human and my overall reserves in this respect are considerably depleted from what they might be otherwise. So, you know, after a 12 or 14 hour day, um, the concept of uh, sitting and recording a, a two hour and relatively structured lecture is uh, an extremely daunting task. Um, and that is extremely apropos because today's lecture is about right effort. So, um, the last three classes in a row, right, the last three sets of lectures, have been around the sort of um, triangle of the moral dimensions of the Eightfold Path, right? And I've taken a, a relatively sort of digressive and introspective approach to these things, right? It's been a little bit more felt sense because when we are talking about sort of ethical contact, um, it does not in a general sense, in my opinion, serve people especially well to treat those things in a highly abstract fashion. You can deal with the abstractions, of course, and you can categorize things in those terms. Sure, you can. Um, but, you know, as with all of this stuff, it's really about making contact between this kind of theoretical dimension, right? Uh, and in some sense, the, the lived sense, which is why I put the kind of emphasis that I have on thinking it through in terms of personal experience. Uh, this lecture, or this set of lectures, and, and the next couple of weeks, are dealing more specifically with the, um, the kind of meditative um, aspects, specifically, uh, around these two things. So the meditative aspects around Buddhism, but also the sort of reflection of those things as they occur in therapy. Um, oh, <laughs> just so that I'm tracking this appropriately. Uh, no, 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 no. What's it been? About a minute? That's what I have this for. Keep me from going over. Uh, although I actually suspect that perhaps this week may end up being slightly shorter than an hour, and that's okay. So, mm, so, um, yeah. So we're beginning to look at sort of this this triplicate set of the uh, the meditative aspects of things, and we're starting with right effort. Now, right effort, sometimes also translated as right diligence, right? is specifically when we're regarding this question around meditation and the interaction with one's own thought and emotion, right? one's own cognition, um, really specifically has to do with this question of mental discipline, right? Mental discipline. And, and really, it is intimately connected with the concept of exertion, right? With the concept of exertion. Now, I will say right off the bat, because you're definitely going to pick this up on both sides. And so I might as well frame it accordingly. I have always hated the idea of making an effort. Um, I have always, I've always disliked it. Making an effort uh, is, is intensely distasteful to me. Now, that doesn't mean that I never do it, obviously. Um, there are circumstances, of course, where I do. But it has always been intensely distasteful to me. And I find that my take on this was to a great extent framed by reading that I did as, uh, as a young man. Uh, I'm thinking here of uh, a book by the logician, uh, Raymond Smullyan, uh, called The Tao is Silent. And that book has a lot of different stuff in it. Um, but there is uh, there's a chapter called On, on Making an Effort. And when I read that, together with, uh, with Bertrand Russell's famous and excellent short book, uh, In Praise of Idleness, um, it 
really informed for me a certain kind of feeling around this idea of, of making an effort, which is that it just seemed intensely unpleasant and distasteful. Now, that does not mean that I am not interested in doing things that are difficult, right? But that is not primarily, I think, what making an effort is about. And in the second half of lecture, I'm going to talk more about, you know, where where effort sits, okay, where effort sits. But first, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, sort of our conceptions of effort, you know, that are important relative to this concept of mental discipline. So there is an idea of virtue, um, particularly in the West, but not exclusive to the West, that tends to look at the concept of virtue as being one where people are making an effort in spite of, of everything right that is driving them. It is kind of like willpower, right? It's like a mind over matter sort of thing. Um, the term for this in Greek is enkratia, enkratia. And enkratia is this like, ah, you know, like biting on your fist, right, to try to resist temptation and to try to do the thing that you're supposed to do. It's this sort of very willpower driven idea. And that's an appealing idea for people. People are in love with willpower. It doesn't, it doesn't help, honestly, that there do seem to be some exemplars, right? There are some rare people who, by virtue of some particular configuration of their genetics and constitution and personality and whatever, do seem to be able to draw, right, some greater source of effort in this in this sense. Um, and we consider these people to be intensely admirable, right? Um, but the idea that effort in and of itself is sort of the root of all achievement is a little misleading. And so although it is the case, right, that definitely, right, it's possible to, to get screwy ideas in your head, uh, in this direction around effort. So I'm thinking here, for instance, about uh, about the psychology work of um, Carol Dweck. Okay, so many of you will be familiar with Dweck, but Dweck looked at the behavior of kids specifically, okay, and looked at their approaches to problem solving. So we are going to talk about Buddhism in a minute, but I want to frame this a bit. Um, she looked at their, their um, uh, relationship to problem solving. And so what she did basically, was she took two groups of, of kids and she gave them a relatively a relatively easy math problem, right? Not easy, easy. It did require some effort, but one that was, you know, within their ability to solve. So she gave it to these two groups of kids. And the idea here was that, um, that they would indeed solve it. And the variable, right, the, the difference between the two groups was that the first group was praised in terms of their intelligence, right? Wow. You must be so smart. You must be so smart. Really good, really good at math that you got that, right? That produces a nice warm, warm, fuzzy feeling, right? Oh, I'm so smart. Uh, and the other group was praised in terms of their effort, right? Praised in terms of their effort. Wow, you must have worked really hard. That's great. Now, that also produces a warm, fuzzy feeling, but it's a very different kind of warm, fuzzy feeling. First group was praised for sort of a, a native ability that's frankly largely out of their control. And the second group was praised for their effort. Now, what's interesting, and frankly, like much of social psychology, I, it's hard to speak to the current status of these findings, right? The replication crisis, if you're not familiar with it, the replication crisis has been a real problem in psychology, which is a lot of results have not replicated well. I know that there are some issues around these findings, but in general, I think they still stand as of, as of this recording and my knowledge. So the interesting thing is how those two groups approach difficult problems thereafter, if you give them a difficult math problem after that. The group that you praise the intelligence of, right, often becomes actually highly avoidant of solving further problems, right, they become highly avoidant. The group, on the other hand, that you've praised in terms of their effort, right, will tend to make an approach, will attempt to solve those problems despite the fact that they're difficult. Why? Now, the idea, right, within this particular idea of sort of Dweckian reinforcement is it's pretty simple if you think about it for a second. The first group has been praised in terms of their intelligence, and that is like a positive feeling. But now it's something that needs to be defended, right? 
I am intelligent becomes a positive virtue that they've associated with themselves. And so it has to be defended. And if they hit a problem, a math problem, that seems difficult enough that it is sort of beyond their ability, it threatens that conception, which in our terms we might call like an ego attachment to the idea of intelligence. It threatens that attachment to suddenly be in a circumstance where they can't solve a problem. Therefore, right, they don't, they don't want to go near it. It threatens, right, the, that particular self-image, that piece of praise that they've developed about themselves to approach something that may disconfirm in some sense, right, their intelligence. On the other hand, the group who has been praised on the basis of effort, right, has this idea of like, you know, working hard at it. That is the thing that they've attached themselves to. And so effort itself becomes, right, a positive virtue. By continuing to try, I'm reinforcing the positive feeling I have associated with myself. Now, that I think is a, a very interesting finding. And unless it turns out to be completely disconfirmed, I think that it's something that many people can fairly intuitively associate themselves with. You know, at the university level, right, where we find ourselves now, well, basically by definition, everybody in this class uh, is somebody who has done well in school, right? One doesn't go to this school and doesn't go for this many classes and things without doing quite well in school. And often this comes with a certain kind of association, right? The question is, what kind of association does it come with? Does it come with the question of the association of intelligence, I am smart, or does it come with the association with effort. And the latter is definitely a more lasting association, right? Continuing to work hard at a problem is a more lasting strategy than thinking of oneself as smart and thus avoiding problems. Now, many of you, I suspect, will resonate with this immediately. Um, I certainly can, right? Um, you know, despite their best intentions, my own parents considerably reinforced the notions of of intelligence. And actually more than that, there is specific sort of family mythology in my family about achieving uh, intellectual successes without making an effort, something that it took me many years to recognize. Um, so there is a, a sort of a, a, a brand of autobiographical story <clears throat> that my parents tell, which is a story about, you know, how specifically they did not make an effort of some kind. And then at the last minute, they sort of pulled it out of the fire and did exceptionally well. And this is something that, you know, a, a sort of story that my father told a lot of, right? How, you know, he didn't make an effort, but he came out at the top of what have you. And my mother also has these kinds of stories, right? Uh, about how, you know, another student. And in my mother's case in particular, this is often explained with a degree of self-recrimination, right? There's a kind of like, oh, if I had put in the effort, right? If I had put in the effort, what else could I have achieved, right? Because, oh, I managed to achieve, uh, I managed to achieve this thing sort of without putting in the effort. And more or less, as soon as I was, you know, old enough to start doing this kind of thing, I did the same thing. I had lots of stories about how I managed to pull a really good grade at the last second, right, without putting in the effort. And that was something that I had an enormous amount of pride in for a long time, right? Not merely that, not merely that, you know, I was lucky enough to be good at certain things, right, and have information about certain things and to be smart in certain ways, but that moreover, that there was like an actually positive thing in not making an effort and somehow pulling it out. Needless to say, this is a deeply problematic attitude. But nevertheless, one that I had quite, quite significantly. And as such, often, it was the case that when something did not come immediately and naturally to me, right, if I had resistance in a subject, I would find it intensely frustrating uh, and, and sort of want to move away from it, if not outright sort of be like, well, this is stupid. It's stupid. Now, I'm framing this off a little bit because I think that it is a somewhat more complicated problem than that. I actually think that there are certain advantages, okay, to making targeted efforts. Um, but I also think that people exert considerably more effort, right, than they need to, and frankly, often than is helpful or useful to them, right? I don't think effort is always the answer. So this is a somewhat balanced question, and I want to put that out there right sort of off the bat 
so that it's very clear that actually I think this is a relatively complex thing. And in the second half, I'm going to talk a bit more uh, about you know some of the science around this and some of the thinking around it, so that we can frame this off. But I wanted to talk about this because this idea of making an effort is you know slightly painful to me. I find it irritating, right? I find it irritating. Now, in some ways, that is um, exactly what we would expect from biological beings, right? We um, we're not sort of built to make an effort. That's not how evolution works. Evolution wants to get the most amount of sort of reward for the least amount of effort. There are a lot of things that if you think about them in those terms, it explains a great deal about the problems that we have. But thinking about it in those ways that right evolution wants to get the most amount of reward for the least amount of effort, right? The amazing thing isn't that, you know, all of us are thinking, gosh, I really need to get more exercise. The amazing thing is that anybody at all manages to overcome that tendency and go and exercise despite the enormous amount of effort that they're spending with no immediate reward. That is nothing short of miraculous. Right? It's nothing short of miraculous that the human mind is capable of attaching a specific kind of value, for instance, the pain that we feel in our body after we've gone through a really heavy workout, that it stops being unpleasant, it starts being pleasant, right? that we manage to sort of reframe it in this dramatic way. That's amazing. And the same goes for many other kinds of, of effort. Now, when we're talking about right effort in the Buddhist sense, right? right effort or right diligence, and we're talking about this particular kind of moral discipline, it still contains within it very much a kind of right biting down on your fist to present, prevent yourself from falling into patterns of indulgence, or patterns of the immoral. It has that contained, uh, like within it. But also, right, Buddhism makes it clear that these exertions in most cases are meant to be right effort, not hard effort. This is an important distinction. Right effort, not hard effort. The idea that everything needs to be hard is not consistent with the middle path. If everything that you're doing in some kind of mental discipline sense is a constant, ah, right? Where you're biting your own fist to resist, right? Natural tendencies, that's problematic. The idea rather is that along, of course, with the other simultaneous spokes of the Eightfold Path, that you can create a kind of self-sustaining system so that gradually it requires less effort for you to behave in the ways that are consistent with the system. Okay, so with all that framed off, let's talk a little bit about sort of the, the basics of right effort. So, you know, the kind of core sutras that talk about right effort define four um, sort of specific places where right effort, where right diligence, where right exertion is meant to occur. Okay, so first, effort to, or effort to prevent unwholesome qualities from arising. Okay, interesting. Effort to prevent unwholesome qualities from arising. What are unwholesome qualities? There are three, the three key ones that are named. Greed, anger, and ignorance. Greed, anger, and ignorance. Okay, so effort to prevent unwholesome qualities from arising. Unwholesome qualities of greed, anger, and ignorance. Fine. Two, uh, efforts to extinguish those unwholesome qualities which have already arisen. So once those things have already come up, right, an effort to extinguish those things. That's the second kind of right effort. Okay, three, the effort to cultivate skillful and wholesome qualities, right? So what are those? Generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom. And you'll note right away, those three, generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom, are the opposite of greed, anger, and ignorance, right? So the, uh, the third form here is to cultivate skillful and wholesome qualities, to cultivate these things, to bring them up, right? Okay, and then last, the fourth form of right effort, or right diligence, right? This kind of proper exertion is to strengthen them when they arise. So once those skillful and wholesome qualities have arisen in us, right? to cultivate those things, to feed them. Um, right. Now, we're going to come back to sort of each of those things in turn. 
But it's also worthwhile to consider here the, the hindrances, as it were. These are the, the blockades or the enemies on the path. So what are those? Okay, sensual desire, sensual desire. So this of course being, you know, obviously sort of sexual desire, but also really any form of kind of hedonism, right? Pleasure, pleasure of the body, eating, you name it, right? So sensual desire, ill will, right? Ill will. So, you know, wishing, wishing people ill. Um, and that comes in a variety of forms too, right? So, uh, you know, one of the ones that one looks up for often is schadenfreude, right? Schadenfreude, taking pleasure in other people's misfortune. So if something bad happens to somebody, sort of celebrating that, possibly outwardly, but often inwardly, ah, good, ha, 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 something bad happened to them. Okay, sloth, torpor, and drowsiness. All these are sort of just like low energy things, right? Sloth, bleh, laying around. Torpor is even more, right? Torpor is like, I mean, I think of torpor as being almost catatonic, but sloth, torpor, right? Having this really like low energy state, drowsiness, right? Bearing in mind that what you're attempting to do here is cultivate the qualities for sort of meditation. So drowsiness, right? Looking to fight that. Uh, restlessness and worry. So a kind of general agitation and a general anxiety, right? Okay. And last, uncertainty and skepticism, right? Uncertainty and skepticism. So these are the hindrances. These are the sort of enemies that one faces on the path. Okay, so this is interesting. I mean, first let's talk about sort of the, the qualities of exertion, the, the first four that I mentioned, right? So that's like, you know, you want to promote wholesome qualities, right? And you want to uh, well, sorry, the other way around. You want to prevent unwholesome qualities, and if they do come up, you want to extinguish them. You want to promote wholesome qualities, and if they do come up, you want to feed them, you want to flourish them, right? There are two wolves. Which is the wolf that gets stronger? The one you feed, um, right? It's the fairly classic expression in this respect. Okay, so let's talk about the wholesome and unwholesome qualities a little bit. So they're arranged in counterpoint. So greed, right? Generosity, fine. Anger, loving kindness, good. Wisdom, no, wait a minute, I got that backwards. Ignorance, <laughs> wisdom. Okay, so let's talk about those properties because specifically when we're dealing in sort of meditative terms around this stuff, um, the there, there's a great number of methods, meditative methods, which are prescribed. And I mean, there are loads and loads of meditative methods. But one of the ones that is, is sort of often brought up is um, a kind of visualization technique, right? Or a replacement technique. So let's say for a second that feelings of greed start rising. Okay, well, how does that show up for you? I mean, greed can show up in a kind of jealousy, right? Or in a desire for material things. Um, and generosity, right? How does generosity show up? Well, in not being sort of covetous in giving gifts, in giving people things and expecting nothing in return, right? In a willingness to, to part with resources and not being like, like clinging and attached to resources. It's very difficult for people. It's very difficult for people, especially, right? People who have not had a lot of resources to throw around. Mm. If, you know, if you grew up without a lot, you grew up without a lot of money, right? Your attitude towards this sort of thing may be, may feel sort of survival oriented, right? But it can also be the case that people obviously attach to greed as its own good, right? One wonders, for instance, about people who are acquiring money, you know, past a certain point, okay? Some people are obviously very, very focused on the monetary aspect of their careers, right? Ah, I made another, you know, whatever, $50 million today. Okay, like, what are you doing with it, right? How does that impact? Well, more is better, is it? Is more better? When we look at the psychology around this, we find that, well, it's not quite true that money doesn't buy happiness. 
That isn't quite true. What is true is that past about seventy thousand uh, dollars U.S., so a little higher in Canada, more like a hundred, right? Uh, it doesn't, in fact, seem to buy any more satisfaction under normal conditions, right? It doesn't buy happiness, but up to that point, it does because what it does is prevent anxieties. And I pointed this out a little bit last lecture. You know, not having enough money to be able to do basic things can be intensely stressful. If you don't know how you're going to eat, that definitely impacts upon your, you know, ability to think, you know, freely and openly and charitably. It definitely does, right? And if that presents a threat, and a threat can come in a lot of forms, I add. So um, one of the things when I was quite poor, one of the things that impacted me most strongly uh, was the question of being able to give gifts. It impacted me very intensely. There was a time in my life when I probably spent 80% of my annual income on gifts. Now, my annual income was not very high, right? It was quite low, quite low, but very, very below the poverty line in Canada. But nevertheless, like the giving of gifts was one of my great concerns. Why? Because I wanted to be able to demonstrate my gratitude towards other people, but also because I knew that regardless of what I said, other people were going to buy me gifts come birthday or Christmas or whatever. And if I couldn't buy them gifts, this was so, so painful, so painful, so painful to, to feel right unable to do that. Um, so an enormous amount of my income went specifically towards that, right? And so, you know, having an increased income as time has gone on, right? And having a more stable income in part is about just banishing certain kinds of anxieties, right? Now, are there more direct ways to banish those anxieties? Maybe, probably. But, you know, as a side effect of work, you know, being reasonably compensated, and I don't think unfairly compensated, I don't think. I don't think maybe that's, I mean, maybe that's me having a very high opinion of myself, hard to say. But I feel like I'm reasonably compensated. Um, and so it doesn't feel like greed, I'm not scrabbling afterwards, but my anxieties are considerably reduced. Like I said, if one of, if I got a tooth infection tomorrow, it wouldn't be a question, how am I gonna pay for this? This is one of the things that I often think of when I think of friends and colleagues that I have in the States, right? Where a medical bill can be the sort of thing that financially destroys you, right? You can, you know, you have a heart attack or something, you rack up a hundred thousand dollars in debt like that, right? <laughs> one of the points of having a system of socialized medicine as indeed we do here is the prevention of precisely that because it puts people in a very bad place. I add, <clears throat> this also applies to student loans. Student loans. A much bigger problem in the States than it is here, but it's like, not that it's not a problem here. But in the States, of course, people are burdened with student loans at this point, right? They've been told you must have this to have an education. You must have it. Or sorry, you must uh, take a student loan if you want an education, like you basically can't afford it otherwise, unless you can get some incredibly good scholarship. If you don't have it, you will be consigned to only the hottest and dirtiest of jobs. Okay, and so people rack up huge amounts, huge amounts of debt. And then they carry that debt around with them. And basically, that means that they have less flexibility in terms of what they do, they have less choice. This is why we have the concept of the wage slave. Right. So escaping that right? Escaping the feeling of being beholden to fear in that particular way, I don't think constitutes greed. And I want to emphasize here that there is a, you know, a middle path. This is not meant to be, right, the escape of greed through generosity until one has nothing, although simplicity is a very good thing. But rather, it's like an endless accumulation of wealth. And I have known people, clients, but also acquaintances who very much operated in this mold more money is better money. Well, after a certain point, that's not necessarily true. One of the insights that I think people don't always capture especially well is the way that time can be changed into money, but money can't be changed into more time. Your time can be used on all sorts of things, but your money can't. And right, your money can be used on lots of things, but what it can't be used for is to convert it into more time. You can't really buy more time, right? You have a certain amount of time. So 
the endless accumulation of wealth, right? Often, in fact, under conditions where people believe that it is alleviating their, alleviating their anxiety, or where they just like the feeling of accumulation. It's possible to get, sort of get attached to the number. It's possible to get attached to like things, 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 right? I, I want to have designer stuff. I want to have an expensive this and an expensive that, right? Well, these are temporary solutions. They're very persona driven, very attached to the ego, right? It's um, to borrow uh, to borrow the concept from Eric Fromm. It's a it's a, uh, a conflation of the having mode and the being mode, right? That we believe that by having by getting more stuff, we will somehow solve the problems that are inside of us. When in fact we will solve the problems inside of us, many of them by being through questions of being by becoming something. Right? by ourselves becoming something, not by just getting more shit. Now, never mind, right, that our entire civilization, such as it is, works over time to try to drive us into the having mode, right? I mean, advertising is to a great extent. Those of you who watched Century of the Self when I recommended it will know that that is essentially speaking the basis of the modern PR system, right? It's to try to exploit your... Um, your uh, sort of unconscious emotional needs and make you believe that by purchasing the product, you'll be solving those problems. And you, by and large, you're not going to solve internal emotional problems by buying things, but that's what they try to get you to do, right? And in, to say that we've predicated a whole system on that is an understatement, right? Uh, after 9-11, one of the first things that they said after 9-11, President uh, George W. Bush got out and said, everybody basically needs to start shopping. Well, the reason they needed to start shopping was if they didn't, the whole economy was going to fall apart because the entire economy has been geared towards the idea of consumerism, people buying things that they don't need. And of course, companies creating things that are junk, that fall apart so that you have to buy more junk. <laughs> so that's something of a, of a critique. I like things that last. If I could buy some appliances from the 1950s, I would. They run forever. Anyway, so this is the question of greed. I like, are you accumulating above and beyond your needs? And I don't think it's necessarily a problem to like nice things or lasting things or whatever, but there is this like accumulation for accumulation's sake. And you can see how the counter to that is this question of generosity, right? Giving in a magnanimous way with no expectation of reward and no expectation of return. When you do something nice for somebody in that way, right? Give them money and you don't worry about it. Give them money because it's within your power to do. You know, a homeless person on the street and you give them 20 bucks, and why? You know, you'll probably never see them again. And the answer is because that 20 bucks makes a difference for them. And like, it kind of makes a difference for you, right? But probably not the same degree of difference, you know? Probably not the same degree of difference. I remember a particularly low point in my own life when I was financially um, really low. I was between jobs. I'd moved back to the city. And I hadn't yet found a job. And um, I seriously considered, actually, this is many years ago, I seriously considered taking a job at the Porter's Lodge at U of T. And I knew somebody that worked in the Porter's Lodge um, and she, um, you know, had agreed to put in a good word for me. Now, the consequence of this was that if I had gotten this job, I would have worked every Friday night and Saturday night through the night, and uh, I would have been paid minimum wage, so it would have given me not quite enough money to pay my rent. So I would have had to supplement in some way. Now, I had taken OSAP and, and the rest, so I could do that, but, like, that seemed... Uh, uh, not, not great to me every Friday and Saturday night, right? It was like, when am I going to socialize with people? Like, when am I going to get my downtime? It seems like I'm just going to be doing school and work and that's it, right? Mm. So I was really wrestling with this because I needed it. I didn't have, didn't have much money. And ultimately speaking, I decided to hold out. And indeed, I was lucky. I had good fortune. And I located another job, which ended up being, in fact, a terrific job um, doing tutoring work. Um, but at this point, I was still sort of contemplating this. I was very hard up for money. 
So I was hanging out with my, my ex-girlfriend and she agreed, um, ex-girlfriend of a number of years past, we were friends, and she agreed to lend me a hundred bucks. And this is great. This was looking to be like grocery money. And on the way home, I lost it. I still don't know how, but I lost it. Like she gave me a hundred dollar bill and I lost it. And I got home and suddenly I didn't have the hundred dollars and also I owed her a hundred dollars. And it was just like, ugh, and I didn't have a job. Nevertheless, let's say that I had taken that hundred dollars and I had given it to somebody, somebody who was really poor, somebody who had no place to sleep. The fact is not having that hundred dollars, I was fine. It didn't feel like it at the time, right? The time it was serious. At the time I felt panicky. I was like, I don't know how I'm gonna pay my rent. I don't know how I'm gonna eat. What am I gonna do? I will add that spending a bunch of years in a state of relative poverty was quite good for me in this sense. You know, I was never poor, I was always broke for a long time. But the point is that it really recalibrated my sense of what I could and couldn't survive. Uh, and indeed my, my father, <laughs> towards my sort of late uh, 20s, said to me at some point, he was like, you know, I used to be worried about you, um, but uh, you don't seem to be starving. Um, and he was right, you know, it's like, well, I guess I'm doing something. I have somehow figured it out, right? Like some combination of things, I'm staying alive. I've never felt like I was gonna starve to death. But there are definitely people who, right, for whom that hundred bucks, I honestly hope that whoever found that hundred bucks, because I think probably it just got dropped somehow. I don't think I got pickpocketed. We don't really have a tradition of pickpockets anymore in North America. In other countries, they've maintained the arts of pickpocketing, including in Europe. Um, Barcelona, or Barcelona, rather, properly, uh, is, a, is like a, a nest of the pickpocketing arts. But we don't really have that here. So I don't think somebody nicked it off of me. I think they just dropped it. And I sort of hope whoever found it needed it more than I did. You know? Needed it more than I did. Because it turns out, I didn't need it. I mean, it would have been nice, don't get me wrong. But I didn't need it. I didn't need it. Likewise, when I lived in India, early when I was there, um, I, I did get pickpocketed. I was at the market and I got pickpocketed by a very skillful group of children. Um, I thought I was very savvy and I believed that I had interrupted them in the middle of this act. I sort of caught a kid with his hand in my pocket and pulled it out and said, no, and whatever. And then I walked, you know, like about, they scattered and I walked about 15 feet further and tapped my pocket. And I was like, wait, this doesn't feel quite right. And when I pulled out my money clip, which I had gotten ironically at the New York Stock Exchange uh, as a piece of merchandise, I pulled it out and realized they had completely nicked my money clip uh, and then replaced it with a rock and slipped me with a rock. And uh, honestly, totally worth the price of the story because that was amazing. Um, also, I add, I was not exactly a novice at this and I didn't keep serious money in my money clip. I kept it in a money belt under my shirt. That was my decoy. But even still, I was impressed. And the point is when they nicked it, I mean, it was ironic at the time that I had a New York Stock Exchange money clip. Um, that was ironic. It's perhaps even more ironic that a, a beggar kid in the market in India would have one. But basically I, I didn't have any ill will there because I was like, well, I sort of wish that you hadn't nicked it from me, but you did it with skill and I don't begrudge it. Like you need this money more than I do. Do those qualify as generosity? Sometimes they do. Sometimes people take things from you and you can just experience, I think, a kind of magnanimous unfolding and just be like, you know what, it's fine, I'm fine. And the same thing basically applies. It's exactly the same process when you give a gift. It feels slightly different because of course you're doing it voluntarily, right? It generates your generosity, but then it's easy to get your ego attached to it. Oh, what a great person I am for my generosity. Whereas instead, it's like, if somebody gets your money, if it's not gonna destroy you, you're just like, I think the same way. It's like, sometimes I get overcharged on things and sometimes I get undercharged on things. And anytime this happens, my sister will become quite upset about it. And she'll be like, well, no, no, no. And I'll be like, eh, you know, like whatever. You, you gain, you lose. Like I have also found sums of money in my life and I have gotten sort of windfalls and I've had good fortune. And I try not to be too attached to all of it. If it looks like I'm gonna be in serious danger, then it's time to make an effort. But if it doesn't, if it doesn't, then the question is, well, what is it precisely that I'm attached to and concerned with here? 
Do I need to be greedy? Do I need to be this kind of attached to my money? Why am I this kind of attached to my money? Now, obviously, for many people, their monetary situation is not isolated to them. And so it is the case that, right, their considerations include other people, family, maybe their kids, maybe their parents, maybe both, right? That there is a, a wider circle of care that they have to be concerned with. And it's true. Under those circumstances, they have to be more concerned with money. Um, you know, one of the privileges, and I'm using that word specifically, right, of being in certain kinds of social positions is the ability to walk away. This is why, in fact, I'm generally speaking quite supportive of certain Northern European social programs, which will allow you to basically quit your job if you hate it and take time to train in something else. It doesn't serve anybody well for people to be locked in a state of misery and wage slavery. And yet, very often, hopefully this is the case. People take, take work to sort of make ends meet. So the question is where that becomes greed, where it becomes this clutching and attachment and how that interfaces together with generosity. Okay, well, let's consider anger. Anger is clarifying. It's also muddling, but it's clarifying. People would very often rather be angry than be sad, right? Why? Anger cuts the world into black and white. I'm in the right, they're in the wrong. It's clarifying, right? It's clarifying and it's energizing. Compared to sadness, it's intensely energizing to be angry, right? You can really feel it stir you up. And if you have felt sort of sunk into the doldrums of sadness for a long time, getting pissed off can actually be highly effective. Now, Generally speaking, it's the case. The comparison that I often make with anger is that I compare it to, and this won't track for anybody that doesn't like this, but I compare it to bacon fat, which is to say that I say, you know, bacon fat is delicious when it's hot, right? Hot bacon fat sizzling in a pan, right? Delicious. But the second it cools down, it's disgusting. Right? It's gross, sticky, white, opaque, it's nasty, right? This is how I think about anger. Some people wanna keep their anger sizzling and sizzling and sizzling because it's easy in some ways, easier than confronting other kinds of feelings. If they're angry, then the world is always cut in a certain way where they feel that they're in the right and they're motivated and other people are wrong and they're idiots or assholes. The world is out to get them and so on and so forth. It's easy, it's easy to be angry, right? Loving kindness on the other hand is a harder thing to cultivate be about trying to let your anger go, trying to release it. And everybody says that you need to let things go, but often they don't provide much of a procedure for doing so. Like, well, how does one do that? And one of the ways one does that, and we'll get to this, but one of the ways one does that is by reframing, right? You can continue to be angry at people, but if you do enough reframing, you'll find that you cease to be angry a lot of the time. You try to look at things from their point of view not to make yourself the bad guy, but to try to get your point of view and their point of view and the sense of the dynamic between them, right? That there is a dynamic that's bigger than just the simple model that anger wants to propose. Now, anger isn't a totally inappropriate emotion, right? There are times when anger is an appropriate emotion, although it is often nevertheless disproportionate. But if somebody is thwarting you, anger, is not totally inappropriate. However, more often than not, it doesn't serve its purpose very well. We get angry at people who get in our way instead of resolving the problem. We just get mad and we lash out. And sometimes it's the case that instead, what we need to do is apply this kind of loving kindness of releasing that feeling. Because of course, if somebody is doing the sorts of things typically that are causing us to be angry, the reason that they're doing this is that they are wounded. It's really simple when you think about it, but like extending that sense of loving kindness and extending that sense of charity, that they're not a demon, they're just sick, right? They're wounded. You look back and you think about it and it's like, right, you're doing what you're doing because of fear or you're doing what you're doing because of hurt. And that's often the case, you know, in great number of cases, right, where people 
are lashing out, they're afraid. And we take this as kind of a given if we consider things like you know, bullying behaviors. And bullying behaviors, I was discussing this actually with a student in this class earlier in this semester. But you know, it's not the case that there are like bullies and that's a metaphysical category, bullies and the bullied. People engage in bullying behaviors all over the place given the chance. But why are they doing it? Well, bullies do what they do typically to score points. What does that mean, score points? I mean, it means to gain like social status or to not lose social status. A lot of the time people do their bullying because of a deep fear. If I don't show people who's boss, I'm gonna get walked all over. That's fear. It shows up, right, as, as anger and pushiness and whatever, but it's fear, it's fear. They're afraid. There's no reason to be a bully unless one feels terribly insufficient. Likewise, there is no reason really to be angry unless one is ultimately speaking afraid. Because the objects of our anger are the people who thwart us. We become angry when people thwart us or when objects thwart us because we get angry irrationally also, right? We'll get super angry at our computer or our car. Why aren't you working with me here? It's like, because I'm an object? I mean, what do you want? Right? But we do. We get angry. We get angry at the weather. We get angry at the computer. We get angry at all sorts of things. Um, one of my favorite bits on this, actually, there is a sketch, um, which was part of this sketch comedy, the Canadian CBC sketch comedy, The Kids in the Hall. I'm sure you could find the sketch on YouTube. And this sketch, <laughs> this sketch kills me. I use it with clients quite often, where I describe it, clients quite often. And the, the premise of the sketch is who's to blame, okay? So here's how it goes. The boss, the boss is sitting at his desk. I may have already done this in an earlier lecture, but that's okay. The boss is sitting at his desk and he says, I can't wait for the company softball game. Oh boy, uh, I look forward to this every year. And it pans over to a couple of like nervous looking employees standing in front of his desk. And he's sort of puzzled at the look on their face and they're like, <clears throat> and they look behind him and he swivels his chair around and pulls the blinds up and he looks outside and it's pouring rain, right? lightning pouring rain. So he turns around and for a second he looks sad and then he looks angry and he looks at the two employees and he says, who's to blame? And they look frightened for a second and they point down the hallway. And so he gets up off his desk and he starts stomping down the hallway towards the person and right. And as he closes in in the direction that they're pointing, he says, who's to blame? And that person points down the hallway frantically so he goes down there who's to blame points who's to blame points right point 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 finally he gets down to the mail room or something and he walks up and he says who's to blame and the person looks to their left and they look to the right and there's just nobody to point the finger at and and they get this panicky shaky look on their face and then he says you're fired person sinks and they slink off the side right and then he turns around and he puts his hands on his hips and he smiles and the clouds break and the sun comes out <laughs> the thing is people think this unconsciously typically but they do think it sometimes consciously sometimes people think that if you could just figure out who's to blame in a circumstance right and you get sufficiently mad at them that that's going to solve the problem right and this is an absurd circumstance because what does that mean, right? But that is the sort of thing that people go off on terrors about relative to other people. So there is a quality of like, first off, recognizing the absurdity of a directed kind of anger, who's to blame, right? In this sort of problem, but also of course, in extending a basic kind of compassion towards other people, right? Extending that sense of love and kindness, wishing people well, okay. Next of the three, we got ignorance on one side and wisdom on the other. Well, what's the specific ignorance we're talking about? And for the purposes of Buddhism, of course, this is an ignorance of the basic metaphysical conditions of reality, right? This is an ignorance of things like impermanence, right? It's an ignorance of, of impermanence. It's an ignorance of um, sort of um, that things do not have an essential being, right? The three jewels and so on and so forth. And the counterpoint to that is wisdom. And the wisdom 
in this sense is again a specific right a specific kind of recognition of these things now if you consider that particular kind of wholesome quality of wisdom you know how does one attain that look at some of the exercises that buddhists will do to try to approach this idea right we've already talked about the meditation where one thinks about their own body rotting away Right? You consider your body going through sort of states of decay, or perhaps you are literally contemplating something going through a state of decay. If you've never had this experience, again, you can go to YouTube probably right now and watch the, the corpse of an animal in the woods on high speed time lapse camera, right? Time lapse camera so that you can see it accelerated and you can watch it get completely taken apart by nature. It is an animal and then it is not. Then it's a lot of animals. I mean, this is the state of nature. And unless you get yourself mummified or preserved in glass or something, so too go we, right? So there's a recognition of impermanence there that is a kind of wisdom because the opposite is a kind of ignorance, the belief that you're gonna last forever, right? And that kind of thinking that you can last forever, right? And that that should be where your efforts are directed leads to all sorts of foolishness. I mean, one of the things that I like to point out, and this links to greed and it links to vocation, but like go and read lists, compiled lists of the sort of top deathbed regrets of people. This is very illuminating. Go look at it. Go look, go read what people on their deathbed regret. What do they regret about their lives? And you know what never, never, ever appears on that list? I wish I had worked more. It's always, I wish I had had the courage to be myself. I wish I had followed my, my own passions more. I wish I had told people how I feel. I wish I'd spent more time with my loved ones. I wish I had taken the time to slow down and smell the roses. These are the things that people have regrets about. Nobody or nobody that I've ever read, right? It's ever like, man, I wish I had, you know, spent more time at work. Now, it may be the case in keeping with our concept of sort of effort, diligence, and exertion, that people do, you know, say, I wish I had worked harder on the things that I cared about. But that's a very different kind of question, isn't it? It's a very different kind of question than just sort of exerting oneself at work. Likewise, consider a practice like Buddhist sand painting right? Tibetan Buddhist sand painting. So in Tibetan Buddhist sand painting, right, they spend countless hours using colored sands to create an extremely elaborate mandala, right? A sort of map of the, of the universe and psychic totality, right? But they create this extremely complicated mandala by sprinkling tiny bits of colored sand, right? And then when it is complete, they sweep it. And as soon as it's built, it's gone. Now, uh, for most of us, right, uh, we get this feeling. It's the same feeling that you get when you're like watching a classic comedy scene where somebody is like painstakingly setting up dominoes and then they get tipped over early. This is the thing that happens in cartoons a lot where somebody has been going through a tremendous amount of effort and then it gets toppled. Uh, we experience, right, that tremendous sense of, oh no, right? But like, that's the question of impermanence. That is the wisdom of impermanence, right? Nothing lasts, everything goes, uh, we go too. So when we're considering, okay, this thing, we want an effort to prevent unwholesome qualities. What does it mean to make that effort? What does that mean? What does it mean to prevent it? Well, okay, and to extinguish that which already arises to cultivate the skillful and wholesome qualities that we've talked about and to strengthen those which arise. Well, that's part of the first part of the formula. This is a method of replacement. The idea is that when this thing comes up that you don't want, right, you make an effort to replace it mentally with the thing that you do want. So if you are experiencing a feeling of greed, you replace it with a feeling of generosity. That is part of the like technology that is being proposed here replace one with the other. If that sounds difficult, it's because it is. <laughs> it is difficult. And we'll, we'll touch on this sort of more as we go, but it's difficult. 
It's extremely difficult. Okay, you often it's the case that you're not really operating these things at the same time. It's not that you're able to, when the one comes up to just replace it with the other. The idea is rather that you try to build these positive things, right? Try to get them to arise. So like cultivate that feeling. How do you cultivate a feeling of generosity? How do you do it? Well, you give with no expectation of reward. You give, give to people, donate to charity, give money away, donate your time. See how that makes you feel. It'll make you feel good. Giving your time and resources to people and your, right, your money to people feels good, right? Now, you have to be very careful about the way in which it feels good. You could be the kind of person, and many people are, who dispense their resources, right? But really, this is an exercise in self-aggrandizement. People feel beholden to you. It can be a tricky thing to give quite freely, right? You know, to donate, uh, I don't know, $25 million to build something, right, important, and not get your name stuck on the side of it, right? Not want people to come back and flatter you, right? To just do something because it's the right thing to do, because it's good to help people. It feels good to help people. If you cultivate that, it gets much easier to avoid the feelings of greed. Then the question is, is there enough mental control to substitute one for the other? And often, in fact, these mental exercises, which we're going to go through in somewhat more detail in the next two weeks, because they're all kind of tied together, but they're like visualization exercises. So for instance, if you're trying to avoid drowsiness, one of the classics here is to um, meditate on a circle of like light right in your mind that is one of the ways that is proposed to be able to overcome drowsiness for instance but the point is you want to get this system of the positive going so like try to get it going and then water it water it reward yourself water 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 okay and when the negative crops up you want to try to grab it and you want to try to sort of suppress it but suppress it is not quite right right this is why i would propose that actually therapeutically you want to deconstruct it right you want to understand it if you don't understand what's going on there, it's very, very hard to understand why it's coming up for you to begin with. You need to be able to pull apart the forces that are involved at some level so that you get a sense of what's causing it for you. Why? If you're experiencing greed, why are you experiencing greed? Why do you feel the need to accumulate? It makes me feel good. Uh-huh. Yeah, like what does that mean? Why does it make you feel good? Well, I don't know. I just, I just like it. But why do you like it? Like, what would it cause for you if you didn't have it? Is it ultimately about fear? It's probably about fear, you know? Um, I've said before, like, I never existed in a state of abject poverty, but I existed in a state of being poor for long enough that it gave me a remarkable appreciation at some level for just the baseline human capacity to survive, right? I have no intention of going back to that state because there are other problems associated with it. But I also know that if tomorrow suddenly I was bankrupt and had no income, I know how to get by. I was thrown on my own resources in a lot of ways. I mean, when I lived in England, I was literally thrown on my own resources. Like I had nowhere to sleep. I had to, I slept in an abandoned vegetable cannery and a, uh, an old crumbled down medieval monastery and uh, a bunch of World War II era concrete bunkers that were built in East Anglia and uh, a horse farm that had burned down, like a bunch of other strange places and sometimes just outside. And at first this was terrifying for me, just terrifying. But after a while it wasn't terrifying because it was fine. I just figured it out. I found some place to sleep and then I slept there, uh, right? And I found out that I didn't need as much money as I thought. But I needed less food, honestly, than I needed water, which wasn't that hard to come by. And like it gave me a sense of resilience in a way that I didn't have before that. Prior to that, I was terrified. The idea of doing something like this was terrifying to me. But afterwards, it was like, this is not that bad. Like I can get by with a lot less than I thought. Not nothing, but a lot less than I thought. And that's a kind of resilience that's carried itself forward, right? Everything is gravy. Not that I don't enjoy having certain kinds of resources. I like being able to buy books when I want to, right? I like having the comfort of a well-heated home. I like eating good food, right? Probably to excess, quite frankly. I am 
<clears throat> like many people dealing with a, a pandemic pack, as it were. Um, but, you know, the fact is that if all of that was taken away, I don't have the same kind of terror as many people have. So that experience was useful because it helped me address that thing. It helped me address the fear that was underneath it. And then kind of it was like exposure therapy, right? I didn't have the fear quite the same way. Oh, I'm down to under two minutes, but that isn't going to do because I have more than that to talk about. So this idea, the concept of making your efforts, right, in preventing unwholesome qualities from arising if you can, right? So trying to sort of stop it at the source. This is a little bit like we talked about with cognitive behavioral therapy, right? Learning to catch these things, identify them, catch them, and by catching them, stop them from kind of taking off, right? If they do start to take off, figuring out ways that you can deconstruct them. You start to get greedy thoughts. How do you take them apart? If you start to get angry thoughts, how do you take them apart? If you start to get ignorant thoughts, how do you take them apart? I mean, that's the problem, right? How do you deconstruct these things? But then simultaneously also cultivating, right? Skillful and wholesome qualities, cultivating your generosity, cultivating your loving kindness, cultivating your wisdom, not merely by wishing to do it, but by making exertions making efforts, right? Making an effort, making an effort to have loving kindness, making an effort to have generosity, making an effort to grasp the basic properties of wisdom as they're laid out in the system. And then eventually, of course, when you've got that strong enough, you can use that to, right? To kind of move this. It's not the only thing you wanna do. I don't think you just wanna suppress this system. I should be clear about that. I think you should sort of deconstruct it, but you can shift this other system into place right? Where you were angry, it is possible to have a state of loving kindness, to not be mad at somebody in quite the same way, right? And where you were experiencing clutch and greed to experience a generosity because, right, you've deconstructed it, but also you've started to build up the positive, the positive, that's not what I meant to say, the positivity was what I meant to say. Um, so good work, unconscious language production, um, right? You've built up the positive thing. You've got a positive feeling to draw on, when you swap it out. Okay, lastly, I wanna talk a little bit about the hindrances uh, and then I will move into the, the meditation piece and you will see where this comes from. Okay, so the hindrances in this question, sensual desire. Well, that's hard, isn't it? <laughs> you know, we all experience some degree of it. I don't know too many people that don't experience a measure of sensual desire in some dimension or another, right? Some people, lots of people, right, uh, grapple with sex and their sex drive. People grapple with sort of food, people grapple with clothing, various kinds of other pleasure. Those things in moderation are not so bad. That's the whole point of the middle path. But like, are they causing you problems? Is it corrosive? Is it destructive? Right? It's a problem if it's a problem. Those are the sorts of things that can slip in and curve you very easily. Right? So the desire, right, sensual desire can facilitate greed very easily. Right? If I have more money, I'll have more everything, as though pleasure in and of itself leads to a sense of satisfaction in life. You know, spoiler, it doesn't, right? Pleasure is fine, it's good, it's even important, right? But it doesn't in and of itself provide for a particularly satisfying life, for a good life, right? It doesn't provide for meaning. It provides a certain kind of thing, which can be nice periodically, it's true. Right? There's nothing intrinsically wrong with some pleasure, but the attachment to pleasure as the goal, pleasure, equating pleasure with happiness, it's a mistake, right? It's a mistake. Ill will, holding a grudge. Do you know anyone who holds a grudge? I do. I've known people that have held grudges for weeks, months, years. When I talk to somebody who's like, I haven't spoken to that person in 25 years and they're still mad, and I'm like, wow, like, is that good for you? Is that what you want? And if you talk to them, what's the answer? It's typically some answer about respect. I want them to apologize first. Like, how is this helping you? Is this actually helping you? If so, how? Well, I don't, I'm not gonna be walked on. Uh, you're afraid of being walked on, right? Fear, status, respect. The people who are most demanding of respect are the people who are most scared of not having it. The people who 
get are angriest about being slighted and hold it the longest it's just drinking poison right it's holding poison so ill will or actively wishing ill right actively wishing ill on people this does you no good i mean that is the buddhist theory there are other theories but it does you no good it's not good for you right we all feel that way sometimes sometimes we all feel that way but like to hang on to it and to not reflect on it to not question it is an enormous hindrance right it's very hard to work on these other kinds of qualities if you're right spending your time hoping somebody else gets fucked up for one reason or another or jealousy for anger for whatever right or will sloth torpor and drowsiness well, those are tricky, aren't they? Like, I think all of us are experiencing a degree of drowsiness, everybody I talk to. This kind of like generic blurs day, right, groundhog day, everything is the same, endless stretch of time business. Mm. Hard not to be drowsy. I've started taking naps, short ones. I was taking 20 minute naps, uh, having learned that the 20 minute nap and the 90 minute nap are the optimal nap. Now with more recent research, I have discovered that actually you can get most of the benefits of a 20 minute nap of a 10 minute nap once you get the habit down. And some people don't like them. I have a friend who doesn't like them. He quotes Poe and says, I hate those little slices of death. This is a strange idea to me. Uh, I can understand that if I had an enormous fear of non-existence that that might be a problem, but I love taking a nap. A 10 minute nap partway through the day does that job, picks me back up, you know? But it's a concession to sleep. I have to have half an hour, right? Because you need like 15 minutes to have a 10 minute nap. Or half an hour, if you do it quickly enough, you can grab you know, a 20 minute nap pretty reasonably. Eat something real quick, drink some water, lie down, boom, you're out, back up. This is good, right? But in general, we're all experiencing lethargy, drowsiness. People are getting less exercise. They're getting less engagement. I've read a lot of articles from people about this sort of fuzziness and so on and so forth. Um, the one that I read had very um, pointedly had uh, a statement like, what did I used to do on the weekends? And this idea that everything is blurred together produces this like winter lethargy, right? That's hard stuff. We don't have a lot of surplus energy, not to the same extent. And that's to some extent entirely understandable. I mean, I'll be honest. When I took extra time on this lecture, I pretty much, I mean, don't get me wrong, I beat myself up a little because I was supposed to get it out Monday. But another part of me was like, like you have to distinguish between the urgent and the important. Lots of things seem urgent, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're important. This is make or break. Is anybody gonna die? Is anybody freaking out? Are people gonna be like super angry? Does it matter? Isn't everybody up to their neck? Like these were things I had to sort of do with myself to give myself a better permission. But a big part of that was I just didn't have the energy. I just didn't. And I could probably have made a titanic effort i could have really pushed myself at some level but is that the best place to spend a finite resource and i decided no no it can wait i mean it waited until now right so um sloth torpor or drowsiness these are tricky things i mean there are meditative techniques and we will touch on them there are meditative techniques to address those things but on top of that um you know there's all the normal stuff like just sort of pepping yourself up right through exercise and all the regular things. I'm, I highly, highly recommend naps. And of course, being able to devote your attention, right? So if you're experiencing those things, that kind of drowsiness, it's hard to pick up meditative techniques. That's one of the problems because this is one of the corners of the mental discipline piece, right? If you're constantly falling asleep on the mat, that's a problem, right? So addressing it. Restlessness and worry. This is like excess energy and excess anxiety. <sighs> A great number of people have restlessness and worry, have anxiety. This is, again, one of the reasons why, in my opinion, right? Therapy in some important sense, doing that kind of work precedes doing the sort of work that's involved in meditation. You have to have some kind of tools to deal with this, or at the very least to operate in tandem together with it, right? So that you have some degree of control so that you're not just trying to brute force it which is what people want to do, right? Ugh. No, not to brute force it, right? But rather to have means of sort of reducing it in slow, steady work so that when you go to sit down, 
that, that that question of mental discipline is to some extent helped by, right? Helped by the practices you've already undergone so that you aren't in a state of restless worry, anxiety, right? And then lastly, uncertainty and skepticism. And these are interesting ones because of course everybody sits on the pillow and at some point they say to themselves, is this actually working? Is this actually gonna do anything? Am I a fool for sitting here, right? These are the questions of uncertainty and skepticism. Now, I have a great deal to say, generally speaking, about these questions of uncertainty. I think that certainty is highly overrated. People want certainty and it's not on demand. They don't have certainty when they want it, or they do have certainty and they have certainty about things that very often are wrong. It's easy to observe in other people when they are certain, but also wrong. You're like, wow, they're really certain, but boy, they're wrong. But it's much harder for people to pick that up about themselves. This, I add, brings me to the meditative technique for today. Now, for those of you who um, you know, have been sort of following along, this, you're gonna sort of maybe be a bit thrown. This may not even seem so much like a meditative technique, but I want you to bear with me. Because this is a meditative technique that has to do very specifically with certainty. And it's sort of a two-part thing. This is a, a kind of contemplative act. You're doing it mindfully. Okay, so the first part is a specific meditation on certainty. And there aren't that many domains in the world where we can get certainty, right? Or high degrees of certainty. And so this one is this. You, you may have to make an effort. I want you to do a mathematical proof. Now, for many of you, you just maybe had a jolt of panic. If you're like, oh, I'm bad at math. Go look up an easy one. Look up Euclid's proof of infinite primes. Some of you that have done classes with me before will be familiar with my recommendation here. If you're a little fancier at math and that's too easy for you, do that one quick and then move on to a Cantor's, Georg Cantor's diagonalization hypothesis. If you could do both of those, you probably you know, don't so much need to do this first step, but try doing them again. Run through it. You can watch a YouTube video on this and then do it. Do, right? Do Euclid's proof of infinite primes. It's short, it's straightforward. You can watch the video, it will be explained to you. What I want you to do is feel your way into the sense of certainty that comes with it. This is the beauty of the mathematical proof, right? As Einstein said, we express science in terms of mathematics, not because we know so much, but because we know so little. But however, right, in that context, it's very, it's a very powerful experience, a mathematical proof. So try it do Euclid's proof of infinite primes and do it in a mindful way. Track what's going on with yourself when you do it because it is as close to human certainty as we can get, okay? And then once you've done that, go do the opposite. Contemplate all the things that you do not know. And I mean here, not just the known unknowns, but the unknown unknowns. There are things that you do not know. And really challenge this because, right, when you look at your beliefs and your certainties, right, the amazing thing about this I have found is I can go through my beliefs and I take it as a given that a number of the things that I believe are wrong. Why? Because a number of the things that everyone else seems to believe are demonstrably wrong. I can encounter any given person and then talking to them, they'll come up with a belief and I will say, mm, that seems wrong to me, right? People maintain beliefs that are wrong. I mean, for much of human history, everybody believed the earth is flat. Some people still do, maybe they're right, right? But everybody believed the earth is flat, they were all wrong. The evidence of their senses misled them. Their interpretation of that evidence was incorrect. They were all wrong. So like meditate on that. Meditate on the fact that like the earth appears to be flat, but it isn't. It's a ball, it's rolling through space. You wouldn't necessarily know that, right? And think about the people that you know who have beliefs that you believe to be incorrect or are having like serious Dunning-Kruger, right? Dunning-Kruger, of course, is the um, cognitive bias that uh, people, the less you know about a subject, the more you will believe that you know. So this is like your loudmouth uncle who thinks that he knows everything at the, the, the dining room table. The thing is that it's a human universal. So there are places where that hits you too. So look around at other people and be like, okay, there are a lot of people who have certainties about things, right? And then turn that back on yourself and be like, what am I certain about that is perhaps untrue, incorrect? Now, when I do this exercise with myself, I will try to run through my beliefs and I can go through them. Yep, that seems right. Yep, that seems right. Yep, that seems right. Yep, that's correct. That's correct. I get right to the bottom 
And I'd be like, yep, everything's right. But what are the odds that I'm the only person on earth who's right about everything? What are the odds that you are the only person on earth who's right about everything? Now, some people do believe that. Some people think they're right about everything. Everything's very simple. Everything's very simple. I know the right way to do it. Do you? So contemplate your own uncertainty. Now, that can be a stressful thing. You know, you take it carefully. Take it carefully. But sit and contemplate. That's why I want you to do this two-part exercise. Do the mathematical proof. If you're resistant to doing the mathematical proof, really do it. Go onto YouTube. Look, Euclid's proof of infinite primes. Slow it down and do it. Do it on paper. It's not hard. Really, it's not hard. You can go through the steps and you can do it. Or read it on the webpage, whatever. Do it and feel that feeling, the feeling of sort of logical certainty or as close as we can get to it, okay? Feel that on one side. And then go and access your uncertainty. What are you certain about that isn't true? You don't know. What are the things that you don't know or possibly can't know, right? You can get into this like um, Descartes or like David Hume, right? You can look at it in that way. You can be like, well, ultimately speaking, I don't know. If you happen to have a philosophical bent, approach it in that way. But you see what I'm getting at, right? It's about accessing the sense of uncertainty, certainty and uncertainty. So on the certainty side, right? Euclid's proof of infinite primes. And try doing, if you want something a little tougher after that, not that much tougher though, not that hard to understand. You can still find videos and stuff explaining it, right? Uh, Georg Cantor's diagonalization hypothesis. Okay, of transfinites. It's neither here nor there. It's really not as freaky as it sounds. These are relatively straightforward mathematical proofs. Try them. Try them even if you're like, well, I'm bad at math. Try them anyway, as per the thing. Make an effort, um, <laughs> even though you may find it distasteful to do so. Uh, and on the other side, contemplate uncertainty. And this is deeply frightening. Uncertainty is one of the driving factors in so, so much of what people experience in terms of their suffering and their mental illness that they whirl and whirl and whirl in place because they want an answer. And often they'll reach for an easy answer rather than bothering to sit with a difficult, right? A difficult uncertainty, but the uncertainty is closer to the truth. So that is the meditation that I'm prescribing for this week. It is properly a contemplation, but it is definitely within the meditative tradition. Uh, and yes, in the second half, in the second half to be filmed shortly, I have to pop over for a client presently, but in the second half, to be filmed shortly, we're going to talk about the other side of right effort and effort generally from the side of psychotherapies.